first question you said that the, the paper is from 2018 yes is does it seem like it's having impact in practice yet like people picking it up i don't know um it got cited um relatively often i would say it was published in, in nature which is also had i think had a big impact but i don't see it uh, implemented in any tutorials or something i i have used yet yeah i i don't know i um so back in the cretaceous period when all we had was statistics <laughs> um yeah there's there's a big uh focus on the, the principle of parsimony in statistical models and, and, and trying very hard to end up with statistical models that were only as complicated as need be to get the job done and managing the variance bias trade-off more parameters reduces bias but increases variance that kind of thing and i feel like with the the rise of machine learning methods and particularly uh, artificial neural network methods that that, that principle is kind of been taken out and you know thoroughly beaten yes. over and over again and i and personally i i just i just think it's like it, it just can't be that more is always better in these settings you know it, it i'm fine with accepting that you have to shift things over to another ballpark and you're just going to have a lot more parameters in general than you would if you were doing things via say classical statistics but given that you're in that ballpark having you know 10 times or 100 times more parameters cannot, it just can't be that. It, so in seeing this and seeing that it works um, in terms of yielding the same or better predictive performance at vastly smaller numbers of parameters and numbers of connections makes a lot of sense to me. I, from my own perspective, that alone, you know, independent of the computational gains is a huge result that makes it very, very appealing and that it, also is faster without this yeah. icing on the cake. I think it's a really nice paper. Yes, yes. I'd like to comment on the, the benchmark you did on your on your own laptop. Yeah. Um, but first, I'd like to say I'm rather disappointed by the performance. I would have hoped or expected the set method to be much faster. Since it only, I think you mentioned somebody used like 4% of the amount of information. So I figured like that number sh uh, for the set, it should be 10x faster, so some, somewhere in that, in that direction. Then you mentioned that hardware is not optimized for uh, uh, operations on sparse matrices. I'm not sure about that, because I know like for, for like major GPU uh, linear algebra libraries usually also uh, ship sparse libraries. So I figured like people at least try to get the best out of the hardware they can. The other idea I just had is that uh, GPUs might indeed not be good at sparse matrix multiplications, but maybe CPUs are better at that. So I would be interested how the comparison would uh, turn out on, the, on a CPU, like running a regular MLP on the CPU and the set MLP on the CPU, because then I think the performance difference should be much more noticeable. I can tell you just that, that this machine has only CPU. And I did. That's a CPU benchmark. Yes. Oh, that's misleading because I read hard. Um, I know. <laughs> okay. I figured this was the GPU run. No, 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 no. This was on on this Dell laptop. And I really don't understand the numbers. Like, if, if the matrix has only like four percent of the elements, it shouldn't. It should. It should be faster. But that's what I would expect. But okay, interesting now. Yeah, maybe I should run it on, on the Humera cluster to test it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I missed this. Um, is there a, an explanation why the network performs, well, outperforms other methods, even though it uses only 4% of the data? Is it really just setting these small values in the weight matrix to zero, or is there more to it? I, my intuition would be that um, by only keeping um, the important uh, connections and with every back propagation step, these connections 
that stayed for a long time might be very, very strong and very, um, they might hold a lot of information. Um, and I think that's, that's the reason why they outperform it. Um, because with every, with every training step, you only train the connections that are really, that really matter. And not all the garbage that's still left inside. Did they analyze what the threshold value is to set this to zero? Did they say anything about this? When do you set it to zero? When do you keep it? When do you neglect it? Not in the paper. Okay. I think um, they they said it in in the in the tutorial, um, but I can't remember the exact okay. number yet. Uh, no. It would be interesting to understand how far can you reduce the the weights, and at what point do you lose accuracy? And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but. Uh, can't remember. They didn't, yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, there might there must be a, a kind of optimization that could be done there where you you know you, you are identifying the relevant structure to yield good performance but nothing nothing else. Yeah. It'd be nice to have some kind of method to to do that in a, in a non arbitrary way. But of course, adding um, epsilon and zeta are again two hyperparameters you have to tune while hyperparameter search. So I think these two are crucial for the success of your network because hyperparameters <laughs> tuning is another problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah this only solves. Um, um, the problems you have with fully connected layers. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it just seems like a, 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 a somewhat refreshing step away from the you know the layer on the layers kind of mentality. Just more stuff connected that must be better. I, I'm fully willing to you know to give it the benefit of the doubt. So yeah, there's a lot of issues that still need to be figured out and you know, things that need to be optimized and all that before it's really ready for production use. But just as a, as a kind of proof of concept that you can step away from that and that makes sense both from a statistical performance perspective and also potentially from a computational perspective. Um, is, I thought it was really cool. Yeah, I hope to to implement it in my next project. So, yeah, maybe in, in PyTorch. Yeah, because I did it in TensorFlow. So PyTorch is the other big, big library for neural nets. So. Cool. Okay. The, the smallness, uh, when you say small, is the number of parameters which is small, but the network architecture is the same. The number of neurons in each layer is still the same, right? Mm, the number of neurons is the same as you said it in at the yeah. beginning of the training. Okay. Uh, so in the comparison between regular MLP and this set MLP, the, num the number of neurons in each layer will be the same, I would imagine. But the no. connections are different. The connections are different, right? Okay. So the only difference is that you, instead of dense matrix multiplication, you have sparse matrices to do. Yes. But you have to modify the sparse matrices, which may be the modif modifying, like adding and removing elements from sparse matrix might need more time maybe, or computation. How often do you run this pass where you eliminate values close to zero? This. You mean the, the second loop? The second for loop? This one? For each single remove for smallest, for each training epoch. So this comes very often. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Sachin said correctly, it's like if you remove or add elements to a sparse matrix, that's a lot of memory touches and, and reorganization of data structures. And that may, may just like render the performance really bad 
because as, as we said, like um, rearranging those sparse data structures is costly compared to the, the computational demand. So maybe it would make sense to do this every 10th step. Maybe. maybe. Yeah, but you could optimize around that, but I don't guess it will give you like a 5x or 10x gain or something. Maybe something to micro optimize. Yeah. How big is the factor since I read, uh, read also here and randomly new weights? If you com completely remove that, how, how much would the algorithm change? I, I think that my understanding was they're trying to um, maintain a certain number of connections consistently. They're just taking the bottom, whatever percentage of them, and rewiring them every step. You're getting rid of the weak ones and randomly rewire them. Okay, so it's the only mechanism that new connections can develop. Yeah, to give it a chance to evolve towards something that has better, on average, stronger connection. So that means if I would, uh, if I would take this out, like the innermost if, mm -hmm. then the problem with sender would be that the network would just generate the zero neuron very quick. Yes. So if I would set theta to, what is it, the amount that survives or the amount that gets taken out? And so one, if you set Remove the fraction, okay. So if I set theta to zero and remove the if, like how would the algorithm change? Um, and it's a regular one, right? Yeah, and you would, in each step, you would uh, remove... I just um, remove those below epsilon. Those below epsilon, epsilon is um, what was epsilon? Then? Epsilon is uh, so controlling the amount of layers there are between each neuron. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and I misunderstood. Because you I think it's a replay. Okay. Yeah. So what if you don't remove a percentage, but only those that are below, let's see, I don't know, one millionth or whatever, the zero goes out. I don't know what happens then. Uh, after some time, the network won't change. That's uh, true, because you probably found the neurons that are impactful. Have you? I don't know. Me neither. Okay. Uh, Pierre, I, I actually also have a question regarding, regarding this method of uh, removing and uh, adding connections. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, th this is all apparently modeled after how it, how it works with humans, right? There's also this kind of uh, synaptic pruning uh, mm -hmm. thing in, in the human brain that's not very well understood. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was wondering um, what the reasoning is behind, uh, uh, behind just adding random new weights um, because this, this seems this seems kind of uh, a bit a bit counterintuitive. So it makes sense to kind of prune unused connections, mm -hmm. but then just adding uh, kind of undirected uh, new connections instead of kind of reinforcing strong ones. Uh, at least doesn't seem to be what's happening biologically. So. I think they wanted to add um, this mechanism that resembles mutation, spontaneous random mutation um, in okay. new connections. Um, even though this might not resemble the, the true function of the brain. Um, and uh, to be scale free, um, they have to have some kind of probability um, between um, of how many connections there are um, between each neuron. Okay. So this, this depends, I think, on, on their approach uh, that the method needed to be scale-free. Yeah, just to expand on that a little bit, I think they, they're, they're kind of mixing metaphors a little bit. You know, they're, they're, on the one hand, they're talking about processes in the brain. On the other hand, they were talking about this um, pruning and random uh, connection mechanism in terms of just how evolution works generally, and that there's a sort of mutation stage when random stuff gets tried in a selection phase when the stuff that the random stuff that got tried and didn't work gets eliminated. So that's, I don't know that that's necessarily how the brain works, but that's how evolution by natural selection works. So it seems like they're kind of 
mixing different biological. Yes, it, see, it seems it seems a bit like a like a mixture of kind of yeah, a yeah. genetic and algorithm think, approach with a synaptic pruning, right? Yeah, and, and then I think the other thing was they the target that they wanted to hit, like Pia said, was, was certain network structures that arise in biological systems, so scale-free networks, small world networks, and things like that. And starting from a random network, this type of prune the weak ones and then randomly try some new ones gets you there. So mm -hmm. okay. just you run that process over and over again, you end up with something that resembles the kind of networks that they wanted to shoot for. So I think it's sort of mixed metaphors and hey, it works in practice, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seems seems like the kind of standard uh, ANN approach at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, just a, a question about um, a nomenclature. Um, each bipartite uh, layer of the uh, network does this only mean like uh, maybe I'm, I missed it when you explained it. Does it only mean mean like um, layers that are right next to each other or? Um, where is it? In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the second for each. Ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, I don't remember right now. I know I looked it up what it meant, um, but I I can't tell you at the moment. So it's for for each. Um, so with bipartite, I, I hope I, I'm saying it right, but I, I think they meant that um, there is, there are connections between these neurons. Mm -hmm. um, and for, for each of these layers, so in, in neural nets, there can, can be uh, layers that are not bipartite and are sparse connect, sparsely connected. So they, they only take into consideration essentially neighboring layers. Yes. No, 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 not neighboring layers. So they defined sparse connected layer already, um, as you can see in the in the image in at the bottom. Mm -hmm. These are connected, but with in the algorithm they go over the whole network and only perform the for loop for all the bipartite uh, sparse connected layers. Okay. Not for for every layer in the in the neural net. Okay, so that's way, interesting. So the way I know the word bipartite means that there is two partitions of, of, of like two kinds that, that that stand out. So I would imagine that this is a layer where there is many very low weighted connections and many very strongly enforced connections. So it's not like a median mixture, there's three or four groups of connections, like weakly, strongly, very strong, very weak, but I don't know, maybe they do some kind of statistic or threshold on the layer and yeah. say, okay, like we have many super weak connections and the rest is really strong connections. Then we consider this a bipartite layer. Okay. That's, that's how I would interpret this. Okay. So this, this, this is interesting it's, it's because it sounds like, like it would introduce some, some kind of bias into the, into the training algorithm. Um, I think they are not really because um, they, um, so, so it, it, I mean, just just opposite. Did they did they try this with layers that are not just sparsely connected? I don't think so. I don't I, I don't think so because they they um, remove all the fully connected layers and s switch them out with their own um, implementation of. Oh, ah, yeah, so sorry, sorry, layers. I missed that. Okay. Yes. So you only end up with, so there is only sparsely connected layers then? Yes. yes. Okay. Because that's their, that's their premise. They want to um, start with a sparse network and keep it sparse over time. Okay. Okay. 
interesting. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> How do you say it's like remaining sparse? They start with a sparse connected network. Yes. But then, then, then you're doing this pruning and adding new uh, connections. So I get, how do you, I don't see how it remains sparse. It can change, right? When you remove and when you add new. Um, yeah, that's why do. there's, um, the, I put the uh, question mark in the title of the, of the uh, uh, never presentation. Dense. Never okay. dense because, because of randomness, it can, it can, can become dense. dense okay. yes. But they're conserving the total, the number of connections, right? Across just how they're distri distributed changes a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and during training, if somehow a, a, a layer becomes dense, there might be a lot of unnecessary connections inside, so they get deleted over time again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, one more question I had is in the um, figure eight, uh, eight, eight like you, you had some color mm -hmm. figure eight. What is hidden neurons there? Like the um, so hidden hidden, hidden neurons. Um, when you start, um, so in in every neural net there are at least two layers uh, of neurons, and the um, input of the neural net uh, resembles like uh, 28 times 28 pixels, which okay. is the size of the MNIST data. And hidden is the amount of neurons that are inside the neural net and not on the ah, input or the okay. output layer. Yeah, layers, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here and asking questions. It's always good. Uh, I would have one I have a question, but it's not related to this talk. It's Thank you first for giving me a, even a constantly better understanding about how those neural networks work. At some point, I started wondering, since you mentioned that if you have inputs of a certain pixel size, so you connect one neuron to every pixel. Mm, kind of, is it? If it depend, it depends on the network architecture. If you use uh, multi-layer per perception networks that are only uh, consisting only of fully connected layers, mm -hmm. then you connect each input pixel with each um, hidden neuron in the first layer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, if eventually, like you want to train your neural network to recognize cats. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are cats on the pictures. That, that means the neural network, depending on in which position on the image the cat is located, the neural network needs to train again to recognize a cat. Because the, the network architecture for recognizing cats needs to develop for like the lower left part, as well as for the right upper part of the net. And that needs to be trained and then and optimize like, like independently. Yes. Has there been done? Because I think this is not how the brain works. No, it so is. If, if I look at the scenery and I see, I see something that might be a cat, I like rotate my head here, I focus it, I kind of like normalize the object I want to recognize and then detect, oh, it's a cat. That is so I figured, is there some research that like first identifies there are things and then like starts to like focus on the things and then try to recognize them? Yes, uh, that is, um, these are called convolutional neural networks, mm -hmm. uh, where you first um, yeah, convolve the image and then have a lot of small uh, filters or kernels mm -hmm. uh, with the information of some kind of pattern. And then you, you um, add these patterns um, inside of the layers to get an idea or the network gets an idea of structures, patterns inside mm -hmm. of images and then searches them. And these, this, um, these kernels are very interesting and are now, um, so they are 
a big part of neural network uh, interpretability. This is a whole research field and there's a pretty nice website um, on for the paper feature visualization, visualization where you can see uh, how neural nets actually see the world. Mm -hmm. Because I would imagine if the neural net needs to learn how a cat looks like, like on every pixel offset, that's like, I don't know, like image, image width times image height, too much learning because it should only train how a cat looks once and then recognize it independent of where it's located on the image. Yes, so only fully connected layers, you wouldn't achieve a good accuracy on, on uh, object data sets. It's not about the accuracy, it's about the amount of computation you need to put in to learn that because you actually need to learn it a million times how a cat looks like. Yes, and because uh, you usually, yeah, the amount of epochs is another hyperparameter hyper you can tune, but you don't want to sit in front of your laptop, computer, or HPC. <laughs> No, I want this to be done in a few minutes. Yes. That's what I would like to have. Yeah. Yes. So simple uh, tasks like MNIST can be solved with fully connected layers, but mm -hmm. not recognizing um, or um, saying this is a picture of a cat and this is a picture of a dog. I could also imagine like recognizing those numbers. Like if you have a larger picture with many numbers on them, like it shouldn't matter where the number is on the picture in order to learn how to recognize the numbers. Yes. Okay, and this is called convolutional neural networks. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. May, may I add a small thing here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you still hear me actually? Yes. Yeah. So um, I, I think an important point here is also when you want to recognize a cat, you would train the neural network actually with uh, uh, shifted and scaled and rotated versions of the cat as well so that the, the neural network doesn't kind of go into this uh, into this kind of local minimum of saying ah okay this thing uh, the cat is always like on the lower left corner otherwise it's not a cat yes and this thing what what Pia just described with kind of this uh, filters this is in in turn exactly how your how your visual system actually works so you have kind of a uh, it's called receptive fields. It's kind of a group of neurons that uh, trigger for kind of certain certain image configurations. So some of them kind of work like an edge detector. Some of them work like a line detector. Some of them work like a like a kind of circle detector. And the combination of these of these various receptive fields is then what actually kind of way down the line in kind of the visual cortex and so on then actually creates. Uh, your perception of some uh, some kind of uh, object or something like that, and and this is what what uh, we now try to emulate with uh, with convolutional and neural networks, and this is extremely interesting, I think. <laughs> yes, still, still, even though it's uh, considered re relatively old um, now. So after the AI winter ended around 2008, 2009, 2010, um, yeah, this, this whole field is, yeah, rocketing and so much new stuff is invented or, or, or published um, and convolutions have been around quite some time now and yeah, around 2014, I would say, image detection was uh, thought to be nearly solved, but then adversarial attacks came around and everything changed. And now, I would say no one says uh, something is relatively good solved, uh, solved anymore because they know now that, um, yeah, Someone comes up with a good idea and then everything's broken again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.